Kenny, am I live? Yeah. I'm live, all right. Good morning, welcome. I greet you in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit as we gather together this morning. You can tell by one simple reason that my wife has, and daughter have been away all weekend. <laughs> that's, that's the only time. When the mice are away, no, when the cat's away, the mice wear jeans to church. <laughs> I wore a suit yesterday. <laughs> we are glad you're here with us this morning, and we're glad uh, Vanessa's feeling well these days, and Lena, you're feeling good? Any day now? Soon? Vanessa, soon? We are excited for you. That, uh, and Eunice is back all the way. How was the trip? Oh, that's so good. Good. I'm glad you're back, and everybody's here this morning. Well, really lots of you are here, and welcome to Paul and Francesca. Good to see you. They let the, they took the Alberta border down and, and let you guys in, so that's wonderful. We are a praying people, so I'll ask you to look around the room or look into your heart, and as God guides your thoughts, uh, take a few moments to pray for that person, then I'll pray for us. Father, on this beautiful day, we thank you that we can gather, whether here physically or wherever we are, online, in every location. Thank you that your presence is felt, that although our lives are separated by time and distance, they're united in your spirit, and we thank you for that. Thank you for the joy and the liberty we have in this place to worship you, the freedom to sing songs in a, in a way that we understand and appreciate, and that you speak to each of us through your word and through your spirit this morning. The simple fact that there is the way, the truth, and the life in his name is Jesus. And we pray in his name this morning. Amen. All right, just take your bullet and draw your attention to a couple of announcements. For those of you who participate in uh, Lent, Lent lunches continue this week over at Trinity Lutheran at 12.07, which seems like a very exact time. 1207, and then this Wednesday as well, prayer meeting and Bible study continues here at the church. Men's breakfast at the hangar at 7.30, and then this coming Sunday is uh, continuing on at Sunday school, and then communion the service. April looks like a full month. Uh, the ladies are taking a trip, the bakery trip to Swift Current. I'm not sure about the details of that, although I'm sure they'll let you know. And then on the 9th and the 10th, uh, Robin Hansel, who has been in our district for uh, decades now, he is the assistant to the district superintendent, and he does rural churches. He's kind of the guy who connects all of us together. And he is retiring, moving up to Candle Lake, and he's on his farewell tour. So we are one of the spots on the Robin Hansel farewell tour. We'll have to make up t-shirts. Uh, he'll be with us on that Saturday morning. We're going to have to adjust the men's schedule a little bit to make it work. And then he'll be with us on Palm Sunday. And then uh, Green Thursday on the 14th, Good Friday, and then Easter Sunday on the 17th. So April is a full month as well. I'm sure seating and calving and all those other areas that come to pass. Uh, just a note here from Bonnie Hayes. Bonnie Hayes is being discharged from the hospital today. Uh, for those of you who don't know Bonnie, she had both knees done. And she simply is expressing her appreciation for our prayers. Uh, <laughs> Murray said, the doctor said he never met anybody more zen. And Murray said, I don't know what that word means. But I think it meant she was relaxed. And we all said, you're sure you're talking about Bonnie Hayes? The most relaxed patient you've ever had. He said, no, no, that, that, that was her. So, but this is Bonnie's answer to that statement. I truly felt the peace of God and the prayers of his people. And so God was able to grant her that which she did not have, peace. Uh, Bonnie will, I like this, convalesce in Saskatoon for, before returning home. So uh, thank you for your prayers for Bonnie, and thank you to everyone who helped out yesterday at uh, Violet Lippert's funeral. Uh, we had more food than we need, and I think we're going to have food today left over. So we'll be, I like egg salad sandwiches. So uh, I thank everyone who participated, everyone who came and showed their love for the Lippert family. All right, we worship in song this morning. Good 
morning, everybody. Morning. 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 Thanks. Thanks, Keith. Good to see you too. Oh, tough crowd. Tough crowd. <laughs> um, yeah. So just to clarify, uh, Dan, right? Our men's morning. We're having men's uh, devotional this coming Saturday, and then again the following Saturday. Normally every other Saturday. Next two Saturdays in a row, and then we're skipping and, and back on the every other week rotation. So you got that, Carrie? Yeah. Awesome. And also, I wish I had um, the message in front of me. I talked to Mark Webb here not long ago to check in with him. Mark, uh, we watch his kids' videos often, but I checked in with him just to see how things were going, and he said things were, were going good. Um, the treatments are working, his wife's cancer is receding, and, and things are going well for them. So thanks for praying for them, and, and please continue to do so. But uh, please stand with us this morning as we sing together. for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh cry out for the living God. Even the sparrow has found a home and the swallow a nest for herself, where she may have her young a place near your altar. O Lord Almighty, my King and my God, blessed are those who dwell in your house. They are, they are ever praising you. <clears throat> Better is one day in your courts than a thousand elsewhere. I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than dwell in the tents of the wicked. For the Lord God is a sun and a shield. The Lord bestows favor and honor. No good thing does he withhold from those whose walk is blameless. O Lord Almighty, blessed is the man who trusts you. Yeah. 
As we go to prayer this morning, we want to continue to pray for Peter. I got a text from his daughter this morning, and she said that he's not doing very well, and asked us to continue to pray for him, as well as we continue to pray for Frida. Uh, there. I have a colleague by the name of, I'm terrible with names, Craig. And uh, as a church, and many of us, we have been touched by cancer. And Craig started his ministry uh, 30 years ago. We've been tracking together. He was in Kara Irvin when we were in one. And then just as COVID started, he went to Estevan. And sure enough, he'd never met his congregation because it was in lockdown. And slowly got to know what was there. And then was while he was there, was diagnosed with cancer. And then this week, his doctor spoke to him and said, um, the treatment is not working. And they've given him two to three weeks. So that was a week ago. So we just ask you, we, are, we know what cancer can do. And so we ask you to pray for Craig and his family and for Esteban as they uh, negotiate what that is and what it means. But we're having a district-wide prayer and fasting day this week to pray for Craig and his family. But if you remember this week, uh, take a moment to pray for Craig and Esteban uh, as we continue to pray for Elsassers. We know what cancer does and uh, we are not immune to it. Let's pray. Father, in so many ways, unimaginably, we are blessed. Sunshine and warmth, safe communities. We think of our brothers and sisters, and those in Ukraine right now who are fleeing, the millions who have fled to Poland and around the world for the needs that are there just for food and shelter, the very gifts that up until a few months ago, perhaps not taken for granted, but were a regular and sustainable part of their days. And then the impact it has on the global economy it touches us here, even this far away in our own little world. So we pray for a swift return to peace and stability in Ukraine. And Father, we pray that justice would be done in all these things. We pray for our own little worlds, for they mean so much to us. Father, we pray for loved ones who are near, for Peter in the care home who's taken a turn, for Frida whose days are often difficult, and for those who love and care for her. Father, for each one of us, as we wrestle with the realities of our lives, we thank you that Lena is doing well and that Vanessa is doing well and little ones are on the way, and we look forward to new life. We look forward to the days when cry, children cry in this church. A good sign. Thank you for their health and the gift of strength for them. Father, we pray for Raylene and Daryl and the families that are touched, each one of us, the love that we know towards them, we ask that your hand would continue to touch and heal and strengthen and make whole once again. We pray for freedom from anxiety or worry as we cast our cares upon you for you care for us. We're reading a little verse in the Fellowship Hall. Trust not your own understanding, but trust you. Lean upon you. And so in these circumstances and seasons, we lean upon you. And now for Craig and his wife and family and our brothers and sisters at Estevan as he goes through his final days, that you would be the God of grace in this moment. Father, whatever your heart desires to do in his life, give him those final words to speak with clarity. Oh, Father, comfort those who comfort as we mourn with those who mourn and have hope with those who have hope. Thank you for Violet's service yesterday for all those who cared and loved. And we ask that her testimony the need and the longing for forgiveness would be one that we would all know, that we too would be forgiven. And all these things, words we haven't spoken to anyone this week that you know, joys that we have not shared, and burdens that we have carried alone, we release over to your hand this day. We pray all this in the name of the one who loved us and gave himself for us, in the name of Jesus. Amen. John. This is... Uh Next song here, this is a relatively new song to me. I haven't heard it very long, but it's a dear old hymn to many of you, I know. It's a beautiful old song. So um, we got the ushers coming up, I'm sure. Yes, right? yes Ushers, please. So once the ushers, have, <laughs> once the ushers have collected, you can join with us and, and sing. You can sit and stand. Um, it's in your hymnal, um, number 88, if you'd like to join along with us. And we've got an all-star pianist pulled out of the ranks. This is very exciting for me. <laughs> awesome. Thank 
that after you've listened to Alan Jackson sing that completely different over and over. It's a, it's a taxing job. It's a taxing job. <laughs>
speak to our hearts, but it uh, never hurts to pray. Father, I do want to remember Bonnie Hayes as well this morning. As she recovers with her knees and is given a new lease on life, we pray for patience for Murray, that he would serve her with all his strength uh, and with joy. And now as we turn to your word, these ancient words, written at a time when uh, people struggle with very many of the same things we do, that they would come to life in our hearts and minds through the work of your spirit this morning. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. It was the spring of 1991. I was a young, wide-eyed youth pastor. I was having my first youth retreat weekend, and I was ready. I had games. Donna had food. Mark had his crib. And Christina wasn't born yet. All I needed was a talk about what to talk about with these kids. But I was ready. I had just gotten a brand new book, just fresh off the topic, called Hot Topics for Youth. <laughs> Fantastic. It had great teaching, discussions on all the hottest topics, peer pressure, environmental issues, whatever was hot in 1991. So the week before the retreat, I approached the kids with my book and shared my ideas. 
and I did not get the response I was looking for. They were quiet. Finally, one little red-headed girl named Felicia spoke up, and she said, we don't want to do that. We talk about that stuff in school. Can we just talk about the Bible? Ooh. That moment, that young lady, changed my approach to teaching forever. Because you get all the hot topics already. Between social media and movies and TV and YouTube and coffee row and family conversations, we talk about social and political issues, but rarely do we have those conversations where we talk about what the Spirit says through the Word. So now jump forward 30 years to last week. And last week I filled out a post-COVID church evaluation tool. And one of the sections, sure enough, was a list of a dozen or so hot topics. Hot topics for 22, 2022. And beside each one, there was a check box. And at the top was the question, which of the following are you going to be preaching on this spring? And still, after 30 years, I heard the voice of that little red-headed girl saying, we don't want to talk about that stuff. We talk about that stuff in school. Can we talk about the Bible? So I found the little box at the bottom that said, none of the above. <laughs> and checked that off. Not that these issues of society and today that are around us are not important or relevant or we are denying them. Russian war crimes and aggression has touched our lives and for many of you will touch your bottom line. Ukraine is the fifth largest producer of honey globally. It's going to affect your donuts. <laughs> Drought and environment touch us every day. I wake up every morning and we ask ourselves when was the last time we saw rain. Human trafficking, the opioid death rate, and down the line are lists of genuine issues of justice and compassion. They are the center of our prayers and of our action. Yet, beloved, every time I open the book and read, I am surprised how many times those issues aren't addressed. Now, you could argue that the reason those issues weren't addressed because in the first century, those issues didn't exist. But that would be naive. For the first century was full of radical social issues. Let me just read you a little bit from Ashley Dawn in her article, Extinction, A Radical History. Indeed, the Roman Empire was probably responsible for the greatest annihilation of large animals since the Pleistocene megafauna mass extinction. As was true of the Sumerians, Romans annihilated most of the large animals it could get its hands on and reduced most of the lands it conquered to deserts. The Roman Empire and issues of infanticide, slavery, poverty, human trafficking, these all existed. When the Romans invaded Carthage in 146 BC, it is estimated they killed 50% of the population. That's genocide. Ah, but what about human sexuality issues? That's got to be new. This is from Emperor Agalibus, who reigned in 2000, from 204 to 222. History records that he shaved everything, wore makeup and wigs, rejected being called Lord and preferred to be called Lady, and offered vast sums of money to any physician who could provide the imperial body with <clears throat> female hardware. Issues that we address today. Parents and children, that was easy in Rome. We live with complex issues. We've got young people struggling with all kinds of things. Let me read you a letter. This is from Theon to his father, written in the first century. You have to listen to the sarcasm. It was so nice of you not to take me to the city. If you refuse to take me with you to the city, I won't write you a letter ever again, or speak to you, or wish you good health. So, Father, if you go to the city without me, I will never shake your hand or greet you ever again. If you refuse to take me, this is what will happen. It was so nice of you sending me these great presents. Just rubbish. <laughs> Parents and children, nothing new. It would be very challenging to find a non-technical based issue that the Romans didn't struggle with. So it's not that social and environmental and political and gender issues didn't exist. Rather, we see scripture is so often silent on them. It doesn't give us instruction 
but what our posture towards these specifically is supposed to be or our relationship to them. Rather, what we see in Scripture repeatedly is a great deal about our relationship with each other, with people. It addresses the root issues of our relationships with each other, and it invites us to figure out what our relationship to society is supposed to be. Here's how we get along with one another. Now you figure out how you're supposed to get along to society. And so 1 Peter is set against the background of churches having a negative and painful relationship with society. They were under persecution. But it spends the bulk of its time on how to get along with one another, each other. It spends the bulk of its time asking the question or answering the question, how do these new creatures, these ones who have come through the flood, get along? Churches under persecution, how do you get along? So how are the relationships, and my goal this morning in sharing with you, is to see how the relationship with one another ultimately affects and re changes our relationship to the world. Turn with me to 1 Peter chapter 4. This final section is rooted in relationship. How do we get along with one another? Starting in verse 7, 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 7. I was told in college, I always listen and wait for the leaves to fall. <laughs> this section begins with simple fact. And despite what we talked about in Sunday school, there still are facts. Verse 7. The end of all things is near. Perhaps your translation says the end of all things is at hand. If I was to do a show of hands this morning, how many videos, YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, whatever, or sermons you have heard in the last few weeks all have begun with, these are the last days. The end of all things is near. Beloved, every writer and every reader from the first century forward declared this truth. We have been and we are living in the last days. Recently, at a, in Bible study, one of the people asked, what will we look like after we die? What will we look like in the future? Good question. 1 Peter 3, 2 says, Dear friends, now we are children of God, and what we will be like has not yet been made known. We really don't have any idea. I just know that there are horses, therefore there'll be plumbers. And your dad's going to drive the grader, right, Joni? On the streets of gold. Level it off. Peter just says, but we know that when Christ appears, we will be like him, for we shall see him as he is. As Christ was, we shall be. How do we live in the last days that we've lived in? There's a wonderful story. In 1789, at the House of Representatives in Connecticut was sitting in Hartford, and suddenly the sky darkened ominously, and some of the representatives glancing out the windows feared Christ was returning quelling a clamor for immediate adjournment. Colonel Davenport, the Speaker of the House of Representatives, stood up and cried out, the day of judgment is either approaching or it's not. If it's not, there's no cause for adjournment. If it is, I choose to be found doing my duty. Therefore, I wish that candles be brought. <laughs> I love that. Perhaps the wisest thing I've ever read on the coming of Christ I wish that candles be brought. No matter what the day, in the darkness, candles should be brought so that we may do our duty. So in the darkness of persecution that Peter writes, in the growing darkness of the day that we live, Peter brings forward to you and I this morning four candles. These four candles light the path so that we may do our duty, as Colonel Davenport said. The first candle is found in the latter half of verse 7. Therefore, in the light of Christ's return, in the light of living in the last days, therefore, be of sound judgment. This simply means be in your right mind. And I have been accused on more than one occasion of not being there because I'm left-handed. It's a beautiful thing. But not always in our right mind. It means exercise self-control. Literally, be the master of your mind. Govern your mind mind. 
Interesting, we talk about the presence of the Spirit guiding us and leading us, but at the same time, he says, you and I are responsible for what goes on between the four walls of our heads. Remember Y2K? Remember how many people lost their minds? Remember people buying ammunition and beans and generators and then Canadian Tire charging a massive restocking fee if you brought the generator back? How many people no longer governed their own minds in the face of fear? So I ask you this morning a simple question. What governs your mind this morning? I know my mind can easily be governed by fear, by worry. It can be governed by desire. It can be governed by rumors and lies. Peter says, in the light of the coming of Christ, in the face of darkness, light the candle of clarity of thought, a bright mind that says, I have dominion over my mind. Be of sound judgment. The second candle, a sober spirit. And a sober spirit for the purpose of prayer. Again, these are parallel words. This is self-controlled, clear-headed, well-balanced. This is an attitude of self-discipline that doesn't go to the extremes. A calm, steady state of mind that evaluates things correctly. It's not thrown off balance by new ideas and fascinating thoughts. It is to be level-headed. Think about how many people you've heard, perhaps, who are not level-headed in the last two years. They might have fallen off the bubble, gone to extremes. Or somebody speaking about end times, what do they do right away? They draw charts. They pull words out of context. They make claims about connections between news and scripture that would make a cigarette advertiser blush. They take advantage of fear. Shortly after the invasion of Ukraine, I heard one preacher say, I would advise you to be a giver now if you want protection. Give me money if you want God to protect him. He should have said it like, hey, you know, you give me money if you want God to protect you. It, it was audacious. This is the abuse of falling off the bubble. And he says, stay level-headed for the purpose that you can pray. Rather than falling off the beam, fall on your knees. Philippians 4.6 be anxious for nothing. I can't tell you the number of times I've claimed that verse. Be anxious for nothing. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. He says, in the face of fear and darkness and worry, fall on your knees and give thanks. Every day, give thanks. And then when you're done giving thanks, reach up. Give your prayer and your supplication. He says, call out, cry out, sing out, speak out, pray out. Something like talking to yourselves. This is good. Don't be afraid to speak out loud. Let the wild cry of your fears and anxieties be heard by the one who calms the storms. When was the last time you cried and you prayed out loud so that God and the whole world, perhaps not the neighborhood, could hear you? This is what we do. Our spirit cries out. So candle one is having dominion over your mind, and candle two is simply this, let God have dominion over everything else. Exercise self-control and let God control the rest. Pour it out. The third candle. This is the candelabra. This is the center of the piece, the, the largest light. Above all, verse 8 says, let that sit for a moment. Above all, everything he's talked about, this is the one that's the most important. Above all, keep fervent in your love for one another because love covers a multitude of sins. Above all. Uh, this word is continual. Continually, he says, possess love. This is the word agape. This is sacrificial love. And he uses the word fervent, not a word we often use in our conversation. But fervent is the word that was used to describe a horse whose legs were fully extended while galloping, stretching to the utmost. It was the medical term describing the stretching of the muscle to its limits. Let your love be stretched to its limits like a horse running at full gallop. And beloved, difficult times stretch our love. Perhaps you said to someone, I love you, but I sure don't like you right now. Because uncertainty, hard times stretch us. 
And if anything that's going to be challenged during difficult seasons and stretched, it's our love for one another. So let me ask, how much has your love been stretched in the last two years? Love for your neighbor, love perhaps for the very people in your home. How many times have we seen love tested and stretched and broken in the last two years? Churches, friendships, families, love was stretched and found weak and it broke. So he says, above everything else, love must be stretched and strained. A maximum effort to love one another. It's been said that some people are hard to love, and often the ones that are the hardest to love need it the most. But why? Why work so hard at love? After all, why can't we just walk away? He says, because love covers a multitude of sins. You probably know I love this language, but I love this word. This is the word calypto, not calypso. Calypto. And it's where we get the Spanish word for cabana. Those of you who have been to Hawaii or Jamaica or on holidays, perhaps recently, sat under a cabana. It's the word that we get in Latin, kiosk. Remember when you go to the mall, there's the sunglasses hut? That's kiosk, a little kiosk. It is a little hut. And he says, stretch because love is a little hut you put over top of sin and it covers the sins of others. It's a little kiosk that covers up sin. Peter is quoting Proverbs 10, 12. Hatred stirs up conflict, but love covers over all wrongs. Hatred's like the wind, it stirs up and brings up the past. Love, it sounds like a Jimmy Buffett song. Love builds a little cabana, a little hut, and it places it over the wrong. And then slowly, without light or heat, the thing dies. Now, the other person may come and kick over the cabana. That's a whole other story. This is not sweeping wrong under the rug. We're not denying sin. Christ never denied sin. It's not endorsing, saying, let's just let it lie and keep the skeletons in the closet. It's not renouncing the role of discipline even within a church or confronting evil and sin in our lives and certainly in the lives of others. For love confronts, love corrects, love calls out. It also serves and sacrifices and if you look at the hands of your neighbor, they've probably got scars because of love on them. But once that sin has been exposed, called out for what it is, repented of it, brought out into the light of truth, then love says, and now we cover it. Straining, working hard to build our little cabanas of grace and putting them over the forgiven sins of each other. That's the third candle. Strain hard to put a cabana over sin. The fourth candle. Be hospitable to one another without complaint. Or as one author put it, be hospitable to each other without secretly wishing you didn't have to do it. In a world of persecution, saints would have needed a place to flee. They were refugees in the story. You see, refugees need a refuge. And here we start to see the events of the first century weaving into the events of today. Erwin Lutzer says this, Hospitality is the test for godliness, because those who are selfish do not like strangers, especially needy ones to intrude upon their private lives. Or as my sister has a sign in her house that says, if you've come to see me, you're welcome anytime. If you want to see my house, make an appointment. <laughs> that. The Greeks called Zeus, Zeus Xenios, which means Zeus, the god of strangers. Hospitality was so central to the first century that the wayfarer and the stranger were under the protection of the king of the gods. This is what the old saints called having a harborous disposition. A harborous disposition. That is, the saints were predisposed to harboring those in need. The saints built safe harbors. See, Christianity was to be a faith of harbor builders. When you got past the breakers and the storms, you found your way into the harbor, and there you brought your sins and a little cabana was waiting for it. In a world of increasing darkness, Peter calls for four candles to be brought. Control over our minds. 
surrender of our souls, a cabana of love and a harbor of safety. How are we to love one another? Well, when we control our thoughts towards one another. As my wife says, Dan, you don't have to say everything you think. <laughs> we have to pray through our fears, cover our sins, and be a safe place to be for all. Oh, to look at one another and know that when I am with you, my fears are gone, my sins are covered, and I am safe. This little candelabra of four lights rests on two legs, which brings it to today, where it lands with us. First is this. How are we as Christians supposed to respond to the refugee crisis around us? Well, there it is. Providing true hospitality. Food, shelter, clothes. We are to be those that build and support safe harbors. How is we as Christians, how are we supposed to respond to the simple fact that one in four women experience intimate partner physical violence? That 72% of all murder suicides involve intimate partners. Well, what do we do? We build and support safe harbors, shelters. We've got one happening in Kindersley. We say we will be harbor builders for those who need refuge. You see, the word never speaks about intimate partner violence. Yet it commands men to love their wives as Christ loved the church. It addresses the root cause so often. It says we are to be hospitable and provide safe harbor to those in need. We are to visit the widow and orphans in their distress. And so in doing so, it provides and addresses the root cause and provides an ongoing response. You see, Scripture doesn't have to talk about every social issue, for it speaks about the roots of those very issues. The issues of refugee and intimate partner violence are rooted in hospitality. The answer is there. Secondly, and here we conclude, Christians have always been lighthouse keepers and harbor builders. We hold forth the light and we create sh safe shelter from the storm. So on Thursday night, the hospitality committee, the social committee got together, our brand new, high powered, high energy, organized social committee. We were treated to hospitality, we ate great food. But we began our meeting with asking the question, why are we doing this? Why is the church planning family movie nights and ladies paint nights and guys paintball nights and all this stuff? Man, when men and women think about paint, it's very different. <laughs> <laughs> so why are we doing this? Well, one of the things we talked about in adult Sunday school, another plug for Sunday school, is we talked about having a healthy culture. A healthy culture withstands the storms. I want to put to you that the social committee is at the forefront of the harbor builders. Social events are part of the safe harbor. Our men's breakfast, our women's paint nights, family movie nights, ball games, banquets, and coffee times are all simply harbor building events. They build a place where you are safe. You are safe from ridicule, safe from harm, safe to be yourself, but I know you're not safe to cheat at games with Jack. <laughs> you're safe to be yourself, safe from the wildness and the darkness of the world, safe to laugh, safe to be honest, and safe to be loved. Don't you want to come to a place of harbor where who you are is not rejected or ridiculed. We love you. This is what we do. And so when you've had a brutal week, you come out on a Friday night, you play a few table games, drink coffee, and for a moment the world is safe and welcoming. We work very hard at harbor building because we are called to. But Sunday morning, this isn't a harbor. This is the lighthouse. This is lighthouse keeping. Here we sing and pray, we read the word, and it's illuminated through teaching and prayer. Here we have no authority. We live and love and obey the light. We live in the light and we sit forward facing, I'm not the light by the way, we sit facing the light. Did you know at funerals, when they bring you in, they bring you in feet first and they usher you out feet first? I didn't know that. But pastors get ushered in for some reason head first and we go out head first. I don't know why. The funeral at Squirrel. <laughs> the funeral director said to me the other day, he said, oh yeah, when you die, we'll put you in. Why is that happening? I have no idea. But anyhow, just weird. Sunday morning is lighthouse keeping. 
We come in the light, and on Sunday morning we are guided through the storms by the lighthouse. And so, beloved, lighthouse keepers and harbor builders, welcome to the crew. Please stand with us. hot chocolate. Now the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. God bless. Mm -hmm.